Um, welcome to this session. This is Making the Most of Low-Cost Internet Service, um, an EBB, or now as it's known as ACP. And um, my name is Vicki Yuki. I'm with National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I'm a senior program manager here. And we're really excited to have you in, the, um, in this room. And I've got a great panel of folks that are going to really share all their experiences, all their knowledges, all their knowledge, and everything you can imagine with you. All within an hour. <laughs> yeah. and actually, Vicki, it turns out, because I just got text, we just shared our entire conversation about uh, food in Portland with the live stream audience. <laughs> so, oh, uh, mics, no, everyone. Wonderful. Uh, That's just so great know. to know. Thank you so much. I'm glad I was like actually quite politically correct and I wasn't cursing like a sailor like I usually do. So that's good to know because I don't think there's bleeps added in, you know, when you're with, with a hot mic. So be aware, everybody. All the mics. Yes, your conversation as well. Okay. So <laughs> thank you for telling me that now. Okay. Oh, that, that's that's totally funny. Wow. Now I'm like all. Whoo, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So, for a lot of communities, low-cost service internet service um, now means the affordable connectivity program, and it's available to most folks across the country now. And um, started out as EBB, and um, but it's not the only resource that's out there and available. And you know, as an NDIA community, um, we know as useful it is that we don't settle for good enough. You know, so we want to know everything there is to know, and we want to share everything there is to know um, when it comes to digital inclusion. And so um, that's why we gathered the smartest people in the world at our table, out of our affiliates and, and everybody. <laughs> Um, so our panel today is going to talk about how to take advantage of the ACP, um, as well as other national, state, and local resources and strategies to utilize no to low cost internet services. And then we'll be looking at the challenges um, that we faced, that they faced, and how um, you know they kind of pushed through those. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let everybody introduce themselves and maybe share, um, you know, also um, your community and where you're at. Are you yeah, and before I jump in and kick us off, just curious of who is in the room, um, just with a show of hands, if uh, we have any ISPs in the room or anyone providing internet. <laughs> a, a couple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Computing devices. If you provide computing devices. A fair number. Digital literacy training. Um, a little bit, a little bit. Government. We've got a pretty good mix here. All right. We have a pretty diverse panel today to covering a lot of those areas. So uh, my name is Casey Sorensen. I'm the CEO at PCs for People. I've been doing this for about 14 years, and PCs for People has distributed around 180,000 computers. We have 30 to 40,000 internet subscribers, active devices in all 50 states. And for doing this for 14 years, I wrote my first grant, and it was kind of like, why do people need computers? That's not necessary. To the energy that is here, it's amazing to be part of this community and glad we were able to come together. So hats off to NDIA for pulling together everyone at one conference and excited to uh, continue the momentum this week. Um, before we go down the line, I also have one question I want to ask, and that is how many people, for how many people is this their first net inclusion conference? There wow, that's a better okay. question. Yeah, that's Darn a it. One. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can recycle jokes. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Y'all, I'm Jeff Milner. I'm the CEO of the Enterprise Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We're an economic development nonprofit who works really closely with our city, our county, um, and now actually uh, across the state. And um, thanks to uh, another partner in this room in Northeast Alabama and North Georgia as well. I'm thinking about things like broadband access and connectivity, as well as the innovation ecosystem, workforce development, smart cities. Um, we are sort of that nth partner in the room between a lot of larger organizations trying to figure out like how we create the conditions for success, how to do things for the first time, and then how to make sure those things keep happening, um, especially in this digital equity and access space. Um, so, you know, we, we run a Tech Goes Home program. We've had more than 6,000 graduates from that program um, so far. Um, in addition to leveraging ACP and, and work like that, um, we've also leveraged our municipal broadband um, to think about how to connect folks at, at no cost. So excited to share some of those things and very excited to be on 
a panel of such experts today. Thank you. This is Gina Dirks, uh, pronoun she, her, and I'm with Mobile Citizen, and Mobile Citizen works to advance digital equity and digital inclusion and bridge the digital divide by providing low-cost internet access and mobile hotspot devices primarily to schools, uh, libraries, nonprofits, and government agencies, but we also work through our customers as well as partnerships with the likes of PCs for People and the Enterprise Group and Ashbury and Interconnection and FCCC and Human IT and the list goes on and on and on uh, to provide that access to low income individuals as well as marginalized individuals and groups across the United States. Uh, we offer service on the Sprint now part of T-Mobile network. It's a low cost offering that includes uh, unlimited data, so it's uh, a different plan on that network. So anywhere there's uh, broadband service through Sprint T-Mobile, we can deliver in those areas. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jesse Rodriguez, the Interim Program Manager for the Community Technology Division of the City of Boston. So I'm the resident bureaucrat on this panel. <laughs> uh, happy to be here. And uh, so I manage a portfolio of programs for the City of Boston that provide digital literacy training, uh, manages computer labs, and generally tries to make sure that folks are connected to the internet and devices. Um, and happy to talk more about that in the panel. Great. Thank you so much. So as you can see, we've got like a all, we got people from all kinds of, on the, all the different sectors and lots of experience and, um, and so I'm really excited. <clears throat> and so, okay, so just kind of getting started, let's, um, Casey, would you mind breaking down the ACP and the EBB, how it's different maybe, and um, yeah, pretty much just a rundown of that right now. Perfect. So, uh, ACP is the new EBB program, the full transition to ACP from anyone who is on EBB is on March 1st. Uh, EBB was the emergency broadband benefit, $50 per month off internet, $100 for a computer device, and eligibility was 150% of the federal poverty level. The biggest changes with ACP is a move from $50 to $30 per month, an increase on eligibility from 150 to 200% federal poverty level, and ISPs are required to make the discount available on all plans. So someone can get a $70 plan with a $30 subsidy on it if they choose. Uh, the $100 device subsidy continues on ACP, but it cannot be reused. So if someone used it on EBB, they're done, they can't reuse it on ACP. Enrollment process is the same, which on EBB was go to the National Verifier, get an application ID, enroll with the ISP, choose your plan, ideally $30 or below. Uh, but some ISP also have a approved verification process which is a sign up directly with the ISP rather than going to multiple systems. And that's something I would encourage if you're looking at ISPs in your area, try to find one with that approved process so people aren't going through multiple systems and getting PDFs and having challenges with application IDs. And in, at PCs for People, we're in that ladder bucket where we do have our own eligibility 200% approved. So someone can go to our website in about five minutes. They get approved through the NLAD system. They can sign up for their internet, and it's all a quick, streamlined, integrated process. Uh, so two things to uh, conclude here. Uh, everyone who's eligible, I'm glad everyone is here, needs to know about this benefit. There's a lot more dollars than what are being utilized. People that are still paying for their home internet absolutely need to know that this is available. It's easy to sign up for. And providers need to be encouraged to have $30 or below plans. There have been some recent announcements that have been promising, where major providers have said, now we have a $30 plan available, which is good. But if you have any influence over those areas and can encourage uh, ISPs, they can make ends meet at $30. They need to be having those plans available. I also know some nonprofits working in this space that aren't taking advantage of the ACP benefit. And everyone who is an ISP can now enroll. There's an approval process with the FCC where you file an ACP election notice, and it is a pretty easy process to get set up. So if you're a nonprofit providing internet, highly encourage you to get on ACP. There's an administration burden to figuring out all of the workings of it, the finance side of it, um, but as nonprofits and ISPs, I think it's essential that we figure out how to take on that burden on behalf of the low-income customers. And at PCs for People, we've got all our processes and systems set up for that. So happy to be a resource if anyone has questions on what we built and how we've done that. 
Thank you so much, Casey. <clears throat> um, I was just thinking about the implementation process of it, you know, and how people are implementing. So how are your communities, imp have you, commu um, you know, implemented that, the ACP? Um, well, the EBB at first, but now the ACP, you know, kind of moving forward. So if each of you could maybe respond to that. Or how, how have you been marketing it, or um, have you been, um, have any of you become approved, you know, approved um, verifiers? Or providers so I can go ahead and uh, get going uh, on what the city of Austin has done real quick um, where we were a little bit late to the game in in marketing we started to get a marketing plan together for the EBB but then it was right at the transition so we decided to hold off uh, and rather than muddle the trans you know the marketing message we waited for the launch of the ACP program um, so we did work with the city's public information office to develop a you know a robust social media marketing campaign uh, using you know uh, divert pictures of diverse families and, and residents. Um, uh, we translated that to multiple languages, um, uh, not just the standard English and Spanish, but you know like seven or eight different languages that are the most spoken in the Austin area. Um, that's phase one of the marketing. Obviously, uh, for the city of Austin, we can't, you know, be an internet provider, uh, you know, as a governmental entity in Texas. Um, but our main objective is to try and make sure that we're connecting everybody that we can uh, to the resource, that very valuable resource. Um, so phase one is the marketing. Phase two is how do we get out into the community and identify those high needs areas. Um, so we just got an analysis of the most recent American Community Survey data, uh, which is going to help us to f find out those pockets in the community at the census tract level uh, that have the highest need. And so we're going to use that information uh, to try and get digital navigators out into those communities um, and uh, able to sign people up uh, in, in those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think this is such an exciting moment because for so long it felt like unless you were an ISP, unless you were doing the access side of things, um, you had so little control as a nonprofit organization, um, as a government um, entity, like actually getting folks connected in a way that like you knew they had service um, at the end. Um, and this has been that thing that you can wrap your arms around and go out and do. Um, and it doesn't just have to be kind of the, um, uh, the on-ramp to it uh, isn't especially complicated. Like, other organizations can get in. And that has been a big piece um, of Chattanooga's, like, digital equity work as a whole. Um, how are we not the only organization in this space? How do we take the things we learn and turn them into a train-the-trainer model? How do we make sure that digital equity isn't the work of one organization, but the work of a whole bunch? And this is one of those easy things, especially as you start to think about, like, well, what other nonprofit community partners um, in this space are doing some other direct touch with community members? So one of the ways in which we have really tried to utilize ACP um, is through a partnership with these regional senior centers across about a 10-county area. Um, and since they're the ones who warned me about the hot mic, uh, my colleagues, <laughs> Sammy, Mary, Casey, Mikey, Cameron, are the ones who are really on the ground doing this work. Um, but working with like the SNAP coordinators at these senior centers to do this plus. They're making those direct calls. And this has been this kind of like learning process for us to translate what that one-on-one -on -one experience is and turn it into this is how we onboard another organization. This is how we take something that is, by its very definition, kind of a like one-to-one -one transaction. This has to be a single household and turn it into something that scales a little bit more. Um, like, like Austin, um, we are working with our local university, their ITG lab, to do a lot of mapping around eligibility as well as who is getting service, figuring out those pockets of like who's doing it well and how do we learn from that. Uh, my colleague Shannon, who's here, um, their Thrive region, these 16 counties, um, thinking about how we take this sort of train the trainer model on the road, do local workshops, uh, make a little bit of the economic development argument around this where, you know, for our municipal ISP, for the co-ops that are offering internet um, in and around Chattanooga um, in this service territory, like those are federal dollars that come in, not only do they connect somebody, but they're ones that stay with 
a, a local ISP looking for those funds so that they don't just have to serve, you know, the folks who can afford it right off the bat. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a, anything else that I, you know, I did have this conversation with Amy Huffman about like, but also that's not really what ACP is. It's not sort of how do we get our share of it. Um, it's much more distributed than that. So there are a lot of other really interesting resources I know we're going to talk about. Um, but I think it is this great entry point where any organization can really get involved in direct broadband access, digital equity work in ways that the barrier to entry was so much bigger before. So that's my little note on it. I might just add for Mobile Citizen, we yeah. certainly support our customers and our partnerships with this program extensively by providing low cost service. But directly for our customers, we work more uh, with the ECF program, so the emergency connectivity funds that supplies, uh, you know, money to non, well, actually to schools and libraries directly. So we're more involved directly with that program, but we certainly support our, our customers and partners with, with this program as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for, from my vantage point, there's a lot of talk about internet being a utility and has been for years. And uh, ACP is really the big catalyst that moves it to that utility and makes it accessible for everyone. Uh, our program has transitioned and it was called emergency for a region, reason. All the ISPs that had to take it on, it was a huge shift in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And it's become about 50% of our business on ACP for what we're doing at PCs for people. We have over 300 computers a day that are going out, and about half of those are going out via ACP. Um, and it's huge for our customers. You know, obviously, low-income customers have so little dollars to give. Uh, so right now, a household, if you, they can scrap together $60, can get a laptop, a hotspot, an ongoing free internet that they're not going to have to pay for again. And those costs are covered. And that's, that's life changing for, for a household to be able to get that. Uh, we're also working with partners in bulk and funders to completely remove cost barriers and be able to get free internet, free devices out into communities. And I don't want to gloss over the device benefit piece of it because it's a core of what we do. And I think ISPs need to be pushed to be involved in this. It's kind of an awkward setup creating an ISP to be a computer distributor for a $100 device benefit. And if people read the Benton Institute, they put out a great article of the largest providers, 94% of subscribers are on 14 different providers. And only one of those provides the device benefit, and that's Cox Communications, and that's through a partnership with PCs for People. So that's where the benefit is, that's where the $100 is, and ISPs need to create partnerships to get large screen devices to households. Because there's challenges that we've come across that uh, Lifeline providers are now bundling phones with uh, Lifeline phone with the ACP benefit uh, on that phone. And there's an asterisk that this comes with a tablet. And someone gets that tablet, they've used their $100 benefit, and they're not getting their large screen device. And it's not what they thought they were going to get to really um, be inclusive in you know, digital inclusion work. So again, any influence with ISPs to create those relationships and get large screen devices so those dollars are leveraged for the for the good of the people they're meant for. Yeah, absolutely. Did you want to add anything, um, Jesse, about, about the um, device portion of it? You want to wait till later? Sure. I think I'll wait. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we've been going back and forth as a panel. So um, I'd like to question. Oh, yeah. Sure. I was going to just. Yeah, sure. Just can you, if you don't mind going up to the mic because apparently they're hot. And so, you know, we want to make sure our live stream is in here everywhere. Some of us learn the hard way. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm Dave. I'm from Pittsburgh. We're a device provider, computer reach. Can, do you get subsidies for equipment and the internet, or is it just one or the other? Can you get, the, can they get the ACP for each thing? The computer is separate, the $100 benefit one time. And it's up to $30 a month, which can go towards hardware for the internet connection, like the modem. Uh, our plans are all $15, so we have a little bit of room in there if we want to subsidize modems and other hardware that goes along with it. And we could sign up just as a device provider. We don't have to be an ISP. We can just be a device provider now? Anyone can now go. Um, I don't remember all the steps, but you get an FRN number, you register with the FCC, and you opt in as an ACP provider. Exactly. And it's all straightforward and very well documented on how to register. Great. Thanks. Very useful. Does anybody else have any questions so far? Yes, Asa, would you mind coming up?
Hi, my name is Asfaha. I work for uh, Seattle Housing Authority in Seattle, Washington. So we help a lot of public, res public housing residents to enroll to EBB, now to ACP. There are thousands of them. We have huge need. So w if we are going to do one at a time on the government side, then on ISP, it's just huge time consuming. And people, they may not have the documentation at the first, so you need another appointment. But now we have access to public housing documents. Is it possible to do it as a bunch, as a group, instead of just one at a time? We have asked the FCC that again and again, and as much as it was an emergency for us, it was for the, F for the NLAD that was putting this together, USAC, um, the group that was putting it together. They had the emergency order and they weren't able to get everything as streamlined as they wanted to put it together. And we haven't got the answer of how to do it in bulk, but we're kind of doing our own bulk thing. We do need to register each individual, the apartment that they're in, but since it's that streamlined online process, we've had good luck going to housing authorities and rolling hundreds of people in ACP in one shot through that process. Because uh, we're also getting a little bit of enrollment documentation and stuff like that. And again, not having to use the NLAD system separately, it hasn't been that cumbersome for us to directly type in what's your name, what's your address. And then since it's already a housing authority, we know the 200% federal poverty is met. So like, we've created relationships in Cleveland with the housing authority with a data exchange into their system. So someone comes to us and said, this is my name. We verify, yes, they're actually eligible. There's no other document needed. There's no even ID that's needed. They just prove that they're in that system. They can look up their account, feeds the data over to us, and then they're enrolled. Okay. And I would add to that just as sort of like digital equity advocates, et cetera, we are so used to like scrapping together whatever we've got to try and serve our communities. Um, and we're in this sort of weird moment of where there are, is now more than one resource available to us. You know, Karen um, at NDIA outlined some of those other funds that are coming um, and that are available. I think this is a, a moment for creativity as well. We talked a lot as a, a panel before this about this idea of kind of not letting the immediate, like the emergency solution get in the way of trying to solve that long term. Um, is it doesn't work super well at the moment for reaching a whole bunch of folks. One of the things Chattanooga did you know, leveraging our relationship with our local provider was being able to bulk enroll 30,000 people at once. Um, thinking about where we've got access to those records, how do we make it more efficient? Um, how do we kind of develop our local solution? It's not to say not, don't take advantage of what's available, but I think this is a kind of exciting moment for both creativity and the fact that we've got some choices for what feels like the first time ever. Um, and so that's, a, a, would love to talk to you about how we're working with our housing authority as well afterwards. Okay. And Gina mentioned uh, ECF, but we have other partnerships that, for major projects that are going to be announced for Last Mile Networks really soon, which involve a big chunk of funds for the local housing authority, where we'll be the person that's responsible for going to each resident, making sure that they're enrolled. Um, so we're leveraging the uh, ARP, the American Rescue Plan, for mm -hmm. funding that's okay. going to allow connectivity into those uh, infrastructure, fiber that needs to go into uh, the housing authorities. And then we're leveraging emergency connectivity fund for some modems through libraries and schools. And then we're leveraging ACP for the ongoing internet subscriptions. So we're coupling all of those programs together to deliver the solution for the housing authority to make sure everyone has internet that's in the housing authority. Yeah, yeah perfect. Thank you. Uh, that's amazing. One, yeah, one more thought. There's two ways that come to mind that we can achieve bulk. Um, and one is having one trainer uh, trying to sign up many people. Another is to have many trainers and have those many trainers go out into the community and just being active and signing people up. So uh, this, uh, the city of Austin doesn't have its uh, digital navigator program completely up and running, but that's the way that we think that we'll be able to achieve bulk, is by just training many people to be those digital navigators uh, so that there's many, pe many trainers helping people uh, rather than just one or kind of centralizing that training component. The, the other thing we do is just a mobile-friendly website. So there's a link that someone can go to. They can do it themselves. Uh, everyone that, almost everyone that's in Housing Authority has some sort of a device with an internet connection with Wi-Fi on it with something. Uh, and directing them to that website. And 
you know, giving some credit to someone who might not have the skills to do everything and need a digital navigator, but if they know a URL, most of the people we work with can go to that, type in their name and address, and click register. And then we had get, uh, I don't know if our support person is in the room, but up to 1,800 phone calls a day. You know, so people do get stuck <laughs> and have questions on the process, but that mobile-friendly website, there's a high percentage of people that are able to just self-serve and get enrolled. I think you're starting to get a sense of the excitement Vicki had in uh, corralling us as a, <laughs> one question and we'll keep going. I think one other thing to, to think you, about is... Do you want to sit down? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and for everyone to think about too is, is you get this information that, you know, you are the experts in this space. Um, many of the partners you might be working with don't have that same deep knowledge and to be that expert for them. I think this is the conversation that I mentioned with Amy about like, how are we leveraging um, these, you know, ACF, uh, ACP dollars, um, you know, our elected officials here that like, oh, they're X billion, how are we getting our cut of that? Being able to explain to them that no, actually, in this instance, maybe ECF, maybe ARP ends up being the best solution for what we're trying to achieve rather than trying to knock that square peg through a round hole. And I think that's something too, where there is a, uh, as, the emergency nature of it, um, you know, there are fewer experts around this stuff, especially in local communities, to be that person to work with those policymakers, to work with the folks who are making decisions and help them understand better, you know, what these things are good for and how you would take advantage of them is huge, um, rather than letting like those circumstances determine what the plan is. There's so many layers to this, and we're all just in an unprecedented position to take advantage of and, and uh, what a, you know, it, it's too bad it took a pandemic, but <laughs> it did take a pandemic to, you know, wake us up on a lot of fronts here. So it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to have. I'm, my hat is just exploding. <laughs> okay, do you have, did you have a question? Did you, okay, then, then there's another person and you can, yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just curious um, if the, uh, the impact stories have been collected from those who have received this, if there's a coordinated effort from NDIA perhaps where we can bring that back to the administration so some of these sticky messages get into the media. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we've, uh, even before ACP, um, have tried to get better about telling that impact story. Uh, when someone comes to our program, we ask the base set of questions. Are you employed? What's your income? How many people in your household? And for many years, it was just that first data point. Um, but then when we switched with Mobile Citizen to the Sprint network, we were required to collect it annually. So we started to get that income and employment story of what happens when someone gets a computer, when someone gets internet. And we found that income goes up by 15% in the first year with connectivity. Uh, so, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I think for every 5,000 connections, that's an $8 million aggregate increase in income for those households. So it becomes its own mini economic stimulus for the households that you join the digital economy, you get a better job, you get the skills, and that's some of the data that we're not great at telling the story, but we're starting to get some more of that data to see that impact. And I would add to that data piece, and what I think we did well in Chattanooga was as we thought about who our elected officials were, what areas they served, making sure that we spent time and collect like literal stories to go alongside the data piece um, to be able to tell the specific story of a constituent within their district, one of their voters, truly, but also, you know, when you say X number of thousand people are connected, to remind them that every single one of them has a story about how they were able to keep, you know, talking to their Vanderbilt, um, you know, doctor despite everything. That you know they were able to fr spend time with their daughter who lives with, you know, their father, and their children were able to maintain a relationship over the course of the pandemic. These are the things when we told them in front of city council, in front of the school board, um, that ended up, I, that I think ended up having a, a significant impact on how much more we've been able to do since first starting these things. And I would, as nonprofits, we are never great at documenting. We are never great at, you know, we're doing the work, we don't have time to tell the story. Take time to, like, get those stories and share them. Share them, share them, share them. 
We also know that 19% uh, of people when they come to us have a home computer. You know, so that's an ex extremely low number that are you getting ACP internet for your, your TV and your video game device? Or are you getting it for a computer for remote schooling? And a lot of people when they come to us being PCs for people are coming for that computer, we're collecting that data and that's just an astounding number to me that only 19% have a, a large screen device when they come to the program. It's amazing that you've been able to collect that kind of longitudinal data though, you know, it's like what happens, because that's been the hardest thing, you know, when I was working in the city in Seattle and having grant programs, once you give the grant and the grant's over, you know, you don't know what really happens to people, you know, so what's the long-term effect, so by people still providing that and having to collect that data, that's really interesting. My mind is exploding right now. And one, one challenge we have is our eligibility is 200% federal poverty level. So we get data on those who remain eligible and income goes up by a little bit. But we don't get the real big success stories because now they're no longer our customer. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. so that's <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question actually comes from rural Indiana. I flew all the way out here just to ask you guys this. Um, <laughs> I have a community that's hosting an awareness event in which we're going to have things exactly like um, ACP sign up, giving away devices and stuff. But the one question they keep asking me that we don't know how to answer is how do we reach the people who need this? Because social media campaigns and stuff, they're not online. And if they were, they wouldn't need this event. So what are ways you guys have found that work really well for reaching those people who are not digital? I think that the, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, what we found is you have to go where the people already are, uh, find the trusted institutions in the community, with, with whether that's the uh, public libraries, um, you know, the housing authorities, the um, uh, you know the community health worker network that you might have. Uh, so the people that are already in the community that are already helping people, uh, you know, food banks, for instance. Uh, those are the places where this information can spread far and fast. It's grassroots networking, yeah. Um, social workers, mm -hmm. social work network um, that are emergency. visiting in, in houses mm -hmm. constantly and just having it at the top of their head that I know I'm working with this person and if they're interested, explain what this is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, um, we have used our school networks um, a lot as well, like, you know, our staff of now 20 something, but still, how do we reach 15,000 people um, getting 2,000 teachers to make 10 calls versus um, trying to make those all ourselves? But the other piece I think gets to the most important point, and that's trust. Like it has to come from a place of trust. Um, and so, whether that is that the thing showing up on their caller ID is a school name they recognize versus a number they don't. I, little elements like that. Um, I was talking to um, Amy Vandeveld, who, you know, about digital literacy and this idea of like, we've got to teach people, like, if it sounds too good to be true, don't bite. At the same time, we're up here <laughs> trying to say, look, here's $30 a month, here's free internet, here's a free device. Like, it, you know, we've, trust is how you get around that. Um, that these, you know, you will reach the easy ones with some of those mass market. Um, reaching the most disconnected, it requires effort. And if it is, like one of the things that we've tried to do in a, a small degree is to recognize that, that time and effort. You know, Chicago did a really good job of making sure that the community organizations that they worked with for Chicago Connected were actually compensated um, for some of the work that we do. You know, we give out small grants, we recognize people. I mean, finding ways um, that it's not just an ask, but you know, there's, there's something that you're putting into the game too. Um, helps helps build relationships that whatever this next thing that we've got access to can build on top of too. And another one we've had success with is uh, housing authority billing inserts to go back to that. What are the touch points that are already happening on a regular every single month schedule and put a little billing insert and we got um, they actually made a mistake. They were supposed to do one twelfth every month, and they accidentally put it in every single one every month. <laughs> and kind of Good overran mistake. us a little bit, but it just that's, proves that that touch point works. I like those mistakes. <laughs> Better than the other way. Yeah. Are there any other questions? The questions seem to be able to kind of bring up, you know, um, more dialogue. I love this. This is what we were hoping for. And by the way, 
For those of you that were in the session, the 101 session earlier, um, net inclusion, when you're talking about magic sauce, this is an example of the magic sauce, you know, <laughs> where everybody, these experts have come together and, you know, the expertise and they bring that to the table and then they, you know, because we don't, all of us, we just don't know everything, you know, and so this has been like, I'm just like, yes, okay, now I'm excited, now I want to do more, you know, so now I'm more energized, so. Does anybody else have any questions? Like what's well, what's been successful in your community? Shy. <laughs> That's okay. So um, okay, so we talked a lot about the ACP, and so I kind of want to shift a little bit towards you know kind of these um, other low and no cost um, opportunities and ways in which we can leverage internet across the um, various different communities, the municipalities, cities. Um, how, how, how would you say that that, um, um, what are some resources, like, you know, we touched on them earlier, really briefly, but maybe we could delve into them a little bit more? I'll, I'll start by mentioning something from the, the listserv that I found kind of fascinating, that uh, uh, Digital Navigator in Philadelphia said their strategy is enrolling a family in Lifeline for their phone plus ACP on their phone, because then they get unlimited talk, unlimited text, unlimited data, and then they're enrolling in Comcast Internet Essentials. So it ends up being $10 for that family for the month for everything that they need, and then they do have the, the home internet connection. And I found that kind of fascinating. Also maybe concerning, because knowing working with low-income households, that if you drop something, it's gonna be the $10 a month bill, and then internet only ends up on the phone that leaves with the parent from the household. Um, but still found that that strategy kind of fascinating to come out of the listserv, and I think that's where the question is coming from, is, is anyone in the room or on the panel doing things like that that are innovative for the end recipient to merge different programs or low-cost offers outside of ACP? So I can jump in. I don't know if it's directly responsive. <laughs> Help us work it's away from his question <laughs> so that then we can just say what we were planning on saying. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. So one, one of the things that uh, we're aware of is that $100 for a device is not a lot of money. And uh, so for a lot of folks, that, that's not going to get you all of the device you know, that you need. Um, so what, what we're trying to do in, in Austin is uh, we've started taking all of the devices that are retired from city service. We take those, refurbish those in-house, and then make those available to nonprofits in the community um, at uh, no cost to the end user. So the nonprofits that we distribute to uh, can then pass on those devices. Um, so we're hoping that that can kind of bridge the gap a little bit with you know, providing a large number of devices to folks who really need it. Um, right now, those are only city devices, but we're also trying to connect with the large businesses in the community who will have similar, uh, you know, device, dish, uh, you know, retirement programs and seeing if we can get even more scale uh, by tapping into the private sector. And I, I think that is a good point that uh, I'd want it's an odd fit, fit with ISPs. And two, a family has to give 11 to $49 on a, an ACP device benefit. So they have to have some skin in the game. But that means $149.99 is the max price that you can have for a device. And you can't go get a brand new device for that. But you can get this. Yeah, I use this for all of my work. It's a three-year-old laptop. And um, there are resources providing these in the hundreds of thousands across the US. Uh, and if people aren't familiar with it, after AFTRR.org is an association of nonprofit refurbishers. And there's resources in almost every metro across the US that are providing devices outside of ACP, but at similar price points to that. I can tell you from you know, Chattanooga and the like, single greatest expert on this anywhere in the world is sitting in the corner there, um, our CEO, Deb Sosha, um, who helped found uh, Ted Goes Home, but that, that's the model that we use. So we have been, for the last seven years, doing brand new Chromebooks, um, working with a number of uh, philanthropic partners, but also our, our city and county um, to underwrite our, our digital literacy program, 15 hours of digital literacy training, plus access to a, a brand new device. We do use a copay, about $50 for that, um, because that idea of skin in the game actually you know, results in folks finishing the course. Um, we never let that be a barrier to folks actually getting a brand new device from Tech Goes Home. Um, you know, there are scholarships, there are 
however we make sure someone who has put in the time and effort and has the interest um, in going through one of these classes um, can leave with that access, um, as well as, you know, we, we haven't talked about what the landscape looked like beforehand, but, you know, when all we had were some low-cost plans available, just the information about that, um, assistance trying to sign up for it. So that is some of the foundation that we built on um, in, in Chattanooga. And I do think this is a, a really important moment because, you know, we, we had a, a city that was, and a city government that was fully behind making some work like this happen. Um, I do think there is this much broader understanding of what the digital divide looks like. Um, all it took, as we've said, is the entire world shutting down, always very self-affirming um, uh, to get folks to listen. But um, the number of not just like federal funds, um, but local funders, local foundations, statewide foundations, including one who's put up about $4 million around uh, older adults in, in Tennessee, we are seeing lots of other partners um, in this space thinking creatively about building those partnerships, um, about taking advantage of those. And then from this education perspective, you know, your funder doesn't want to, you know, fund something that they know you can get dollars from somewhere else. So explaining why actually ACP only gets us this far or um, why ECF doesn't apply to this population um, and making those arguments and getting it to be able to tailor it for what your specific community needs. I think that is like one of the big lessons about this is it is highly, highly localized work. Um, there is no one like size fits all solution. Um, we use all of the tools that are available to us in varying degrees and our community end up lo looking very different with a similar goal in mind. How do we bridge this thing? It really isn't one size fit all. And um, Mobile Citizen is in a fortunate position, uh, you know, due to our contract that we are able to provide on an ongoing, very sustainable basis uh, for, for annual service, direct to schools and libraries and nonprofits and some government agencies, $120 annual. And I don't want it, this isn't a sales pitch, but it is a affordable compared to what most of us are paying for this type of yep. service through a traditional ISP provider. Unlimited data, that just doesn't happen, you know? Um, so, you know, we are very fortunate, I feel very fortunate to be at an organization that is able to serve and then extend that beyond, you know, through our, our customers and, and a lot of our partnerships to the individuals because we, we do not sell directly to individuals. Mm -hmm. And how are the libraries, how, how have you, how, how successful has the ECF been? Huge, and I, I'm saying these days, who to thunk libraries are sexy, because, <laughs> you I'm know. I'm sorry, I'm going to push back on that. <laughs> <laughs> Always felt that to be true. <laughs> Keep going, Jenna. Keep going. Information's power, man. <laughs> it is, but uh, we have had a significant growth in the business we're doing directly with libraries, and that's li largely, you know, due to the lending programs. Yeah. Uh, and that's key to the schools and libraries is having this unlimited data, right? Yeah, so ACF uh, is being used for those lending programs? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And we, we've seen significant growth. Where would you say the largest growth has been around the country, you know, when it comes to the partners that you've worked with or that you maybe um, have seen, you know, when it comes to utilization of the ECF? Have you found that it's difficult to get libraries to actually apply? Because I know that... I've seen examples of libraries that did not apply for the ECF, and so, um, you know, has that... Is the There's a lot, challenges? but that's where Mobile Citizen's a little bit different because some of them can afford to purchase our service direct, you know, they don't okay. necessarily uh -huh. have to leverage a program like ECF. Okay. Wonderful if and when they can. It's laborious, though, to, to, to submit yeah. those applications, is and it? it's I'm tricky. Just, yeah, I was wondering... It, it but, is, yeah. yeah we have a, a lot of very, uh, you know, uh, frustrated customers that had to navigate that, but they actually partnered with other, like E-rate companies, you know, to even be able to fill out those forms. Okay. It's, it's, is the, the ACP program similar or is it a little easier? 
Oh, Sorry. Well, to, to complete the forms. Complete the forms. ACP? Yeah. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. It's easy. Is it's it very easy. easy. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. And so that's why I was just wondering, you know, because um, I know that that's a, great, that's a great benefit, you know, and I'd love to see more libraries, you know, take advantage of that. We sponsored a webinar. Uh, we have certainly have been directing people to resources. Uh, they're out there, but it is a time consideration. So, yeah, hi. Mm -hmm. well, while she asks, I'll also just add on to that that we've also had six, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we've also had success working with state specific funds. So things like ARPA, and there's yeah. a big yes. list of programs, yeah. um, but most of them flow, flow through states. The state can give it to a county or city or school based on population. Uh, so for what we're doing, government relations are key in tapping those states and figuring out what, what's available in your state. Yeah. What an exciting panel. There's just so much great learning. I'm wondering, how do you prioritize based on reading the realities of the community correctly, as well as having the capacity to be able to do all this? This is a lot. So how would you, what would be the questions to ask? What is the process if someone wants to be able to do this effectively? Uh, probably longer than this panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> But just, just to not, maybe not exactly, but some things that uh, we've learned over time is uh, almost half of our customers are unbanked. So how do we get that original e-commerce transaction? How do we make that happen? Uh, we have locations in eight states. Um, so physical, on-site, cash payment processes. Uh, we also have a network of 2,000 nonprofits that we work with uh, that we've built a portal where that nonprofit can sign up someone and put the charge on the nonprofit's credit card. Um, so we have processes like that to try to get around the unbanked through partners. But there's a, just a ton of different stories like that of overcoming the different challenges to create su successful programs. And the strategies, how do, you, um, how do you prioritize your strategies based on existing relationships or existing and building? I would say our strategy is prioritized by the customer. What are, what are their needs? What, do, what does the customer need? How do they want to do a transaction? What quality of device? Are they going to like a Chromebook better or a Windows-based computer or an Apple-based computer better? Um, so understanding our customer and their needs and meeting them where they're at. We do uh, partnerships with schools. So it's not just e-commerce. It's not just retail. Uh, we'll do a PCs for Kids program. Where we'll equip the entire school and we'll bring a truck to the school. You drive up, pop up your trunk, computer goes in your trunk. And it's meeting people where they're at to be able to deliver those services, again, through trusted partners. Are they able to keep those beyond the school year? Yep. See, that's, that's what's awesome. Home. I mean, that's just what's awesome, right? Because you have it during the school year, and then a lot of schools that may have loaner laptops, they got to give them back. And if they give them back right before summer when they, you know, most could use them, you know, like, and then have them going into the new school year right away as opposed to getting on another program again. So I think that that's wonderful. And then the family is able to use it as well, yeah. And like uh, elementary events, we still do desktops. Uh, the third grader portability and breakability isn't the best thing. <laughs> so stability of being on a desk at home is good. So we do desktops for those. So it's understanding what the customer needs and delivering that product. I think on that, you know, prioritization has been very difficult. Just in, I mean, it's a global pandemic. We're in the middle of a crisis. Mm. Um, it is, it is very hard without some critical distance. Um, and so it is, you know, kind of best judgment on things and trying to do as much as possible all the time, constantly. Um, but I think this is like the two pieces that I would say on that are, are one, you know, I mean, trying to get that little bit of space to say, is the thing that I'm doing now going to keep me from like what's sustainable you know we know that and we hope that this benefit lasts indefinitely maybe um but it's a subsidy how are we making sure the networks are getting built out how are we making sure we're thinking about infrastructure at the same time we're meeting an immediate need um and how are we thinking about the different kinds of access that are required if a, an individual is, is housing insecure um or you know uh, spends time at their grandmother's and a neighbor's um, and, and bounces between a couple houses during the week, only having access at one of those, you know, has an impact on homework. Mobile connectivity is huge for something like that. What are those appropriate solutions? Um, finding that balance and, and using it to get to that next step is really, really important, or trying to, to make sure that you're doing that. I think that has been Chattanooga's story. Um, you know, what we were able to do is because of decisions we made 11, 12, 15 years ago, 
and have been able to leverage that for a, a lot of things. Um, and that's this moment in time with infrastructure dollars, not just subsidy dollars available, we take away some of the, the, the pushback that we'd get on, well, you're only doing that because you've got municipal broadband. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities at the moment to think about that infrastructure, um, the kinds of platforms that you can keep building off of indefinitely. Um, and I think for us too, you know, it, it wasn't just because uh, we had municipal broadband, it's also because we built those relationships, we built trust, because we had that in place, and that's what this work. When I say, like, don't let the thing get in the way, um, if the goal is just to hit numbers on ACP, but not to build relationships along the way, not to think about, like, how that's a good user experience for everybody involved, that it's not just an economic development play, it's about people's quality of life and building that into the process, that's huge, and that's when whatever the next thing comes along, you build off that relationship, not just that you manage to get someone connected. Um, for us, I think, and Shannon is a great example of this, because Thrive pulls together a breadth of partners across you know, these 16 counties and three states. We have been pulling together a digital equity and access committee for the last six, seven years. Uh, when the pandemic struck, we turned that into an emergency call. It went from 12 committed partners to about 60. You know, being able to build the personal infrastructure, the relational infrastructure. Um, and I think that's, that gets to like scale and you know, how is it not just us working in this space? Whether those organizations are taking small steps or like Shannon's big steps, um, that's the kind of thing that like you can build into whatever activity you're doing and thinking about how it's not just your work. How do you get those community partners with trust, with capacity, um, and who have different relationships with different communities so that it isn't just like, this is the only thing we can deploy. It becomes this breadth um, of solutions that actually meet people, um, as folks have said, like where they are. And highlighting just one piece of that, Digital Inclusion Coalition. If you don't have one, create one. If you have one, find it and go to it. Because everything we're saying is known in those coalitions. And your group, your local group, will know that. Absolutely. And the partnerships, I mean, that's, that's huge. You know, are, are there partners that are not at the table? And it's amazing, you know, how no matter which session I go to, over, even over the years and even now, is just how, how everything kind of ties together. So we've talked about digital navigators in this session. We've talked about coalitions in this session. And you know, those are all things that we're all working on. So we're working on this aspect, but then we're also tying together all these different areas um, to make it all come together. You know? And then that's what creates that sustainability. You know? And then growth, innovative thinking, creativity, and, um, which is just amazing to me. You know? Did you guys have anything to add about the um, about that, that last piece, um, with partnerships and, and all that? Yeah, I think, uh, so the city of Austin does convene a, a group of community members that are interested in the digital inclusion space. Uh, you know, it's primarily nonprofits. Uh, we call it the Digital Empowerment Community of Austin. Uh, and, and there's a hunger for information about how to connect people uh, to, to the internet. So uh, folks are always asking about the affordable connectivity program. Um, so yeah, I think if uh, I would second what Casey said, if you don't have one, create one. <laughs> if you do have one, uh, you know, invest in it and try and uh, make sure that it's meeting the needs of the community. I'm kind of curious, how many people in the room are part of a co digital digital equity digital inclusion coalition within their community? Back in there, <laughs> I see I see kind of this this yeah, kind of thing happening too. Sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, that's, it's vital. It's absolutely vital and it's, it's going to be vital as you're going to be moving toward, forward with the IIJA and working on state plans, state planning for, for dollars. Um, a lot of those, a lot of that discussion is going to happen within coalitions, between coalitions and then also um, the states that you're in. So I hope that that's something that we can maybe help you to um, seek out and find or to get started as well. So we have about six minutes left. Oh my God. <laughs> Thought we were about 15 minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, everyone. So I, I had a question about how you've been or whether you've been balancing securing contracts with um, providers to procure hotspots for delivery, right, and balancing, for example, for folks, as you mentioned, they might be in temporary housing or unhoused or relying on mobile carriers, but wanting internet for, for larger scale devices, right, that isn't, or broadband isn't the, like, best solution or maybe the financial opportunity. So most clients we've been working with have been able to secure hotspots through their children, but it's temporary, maybe through libraries, um, but it's also not um, a sustainable solution. So curious on how you've been able to balance efficacy and you know what's best for your clients or your community members with kind of long-term sustainable options with, with things like hotspots. Our internet strategy is threefold, um, starting one with wired MDU. If we can create partnerships with uh, housing authorities, with low cost provider or um, low income apartment complexes, we want to get wired connections, we want to get fiber connections into homes, and we want the stability of that. Uh, but that's only for people that have housing stability. Um, so we have the hotspot program, and then we have, we're building our own LTE internet. So there's something called CBRS uh, about a year and a half ago. To become an ISP and deliver wireless, you have to have spectrum, and you have to have billions of dollars to buy spectrum. Mm -hmm. But CBRS allowed a shared spectrum that is free, open, and available, and it's allowed more nonprofits, more municipal governments to get in the game of becoming an ISP and delivering that service. So that's our three things that we do, the MDU, the LTE last mile, and hotspots. We find ourselves in a similar position balancing. So the, the program that I've talked about, HCS Ed Connect, where we are providing fiber to the home um, to uh, students in our, our school system, about 15,000 students at, at, at this point. Um, there is a percentage, both who live outside because of um, state laws, uh, the service territory that our ISB can serve. Um, so like, there's a space where we know like what we want up in those corners of, of North Hamilton County is absolutely fiber, um, but we're not letting like perfect get in the way of making sure they've got it for now um, and finding a way to work with you know partners that make it more affordable for us to be able to do that to meet those needs, um, to think about that flexibility and really just to listen to what our um, you know the folks we're trying to serve need. So those who are housing insecure. Um, the other thing that we have done because, and this gets to a little bit, I, I know it's not a great example for, for rural Indiana, but um, we have really worked to expand using data our public Wi-Fi network to find those both like formal and informal community centers um, when it's the restaurant for the neighborhood. Um, and that's where people spend time being able to light those places up um, so we, we've added quite a few public Wi-Fi locations, um, and we see about 15,000 users a month on that still, despite having these other things. And that's one where like anybody can use those. Um, it's definitely not the only solution, but it is a, it's a backstop as we try and, and reach, reach folks. And really thinking again about like what are the trusted places um, where, are, where are our community uh, communities accessing uh, both both using this actual like university data and then spending time on the phone with community leaders and saying like is this right where else should we be looking uh, laundromats are huge yeah. David did you have a question we got yeah. about a couple minutes left okay. so maybe Let me make a quick one if you guys thanks a lot everybody um, I'm just curious with um, the ACP program and uh, expansion on some of the offerings for how you're finding T-Mobile uh, who's also running the Sprint Network that uh, Mobile Citizen Mobile Beacon is on, and how you're uh, finding your ability to keep offering the, those services and what that means in terms of how uh, T-Mobile is playing in the field. Right now, we're transitioning all of our Sprint customers, and it's just a really a lot of fun to uh, <laughs> replace every single device that we've placed on the Sprint Network. Um, but the good news is T-Mobile is playing ball, so they're they're. They're allowing that transition to happen. Um, and I'll, Gina might want to jump in there, too. I, I would love to jump in there, but it's a little bit confidential right now That's in terms of where things are at. But I would, I'll, I, can I talk to you afterwards? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yes, we are moving forward. We are still providing service. Um, we are working with our partners 
to make sure uh, that our customers have mobile hotspot devices and are getting service on this Sprint now part of T-Mobile network. Yeah. Leave it to David to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> We can't, we can't have classic David Keyes question there, there right at the end. There's stability in the program, so. There is stability in the program. I worked with program. David since 2007, so, you know, it's like we're, we're, we're close here. I know this. And one, awesome. Did one other point, kind of going back mm -hmm. to the, the last sure. question, that um, there's a substantial amount of underutilized government fiber. Um, government has used programs like E-Rate to get fiber to every single school. Um, but one thing that was learned over the pandemic is, well, when kids aren't in school, they need it elsewhere. Yeah. And really, even after the pandemic, when people, kids are back in school, they still need it they elsewhere. Need it. So they're starting to be a little bit of a buzz on E-rate reform and how to take that program that got fiber to every school and bring that connectivity to the students and use some of those funds to be able to do that. And then I get out of my depth in that. But it's, it's interesting to see some of those talks happening mm -hmm. and reforms of those programs. So we also talked about in my last session, the best way to make it make um, use of net inclusion is to join us tomorrow evening for a reception that's being hosted by PCs for People. And so, um, and then you can connect with everybody and then also connect with panel members after and maybe, um, you know, this, what a great panel, right? So thank you so much. We're at 345.